So now if we have the convergence for binary erasure channel, we are looking at general channels, meaning binary input AWGN channel, binary symmetric channel, maybe even other channels. And we're going to look at how we can do the analysis of convergence on general channels on one hand side, but of course also how we can optimize LEPC codes on general channels. So let's get started. So we have a binary erasure channel. The analysis was simple because we could reduce everything to a single parameter C, which is the erasure probability of the messages that we send back and forth in the graph. Now we saw in the binary erasure channel, either we send the correct value or we send an erasure. It's very simple because it's just like one parameter. The situation is not so easy on general channels because they're the, they're the messages they can take on arbitrary values. So we need to look at the distribution of the messages. So first thing we do is we look at the binary input AWGN channel because that's probably the simplest channel. The binary symmetric channel is going to be a little bit harder. We're going to do that at the very end. Start with the binary input AWGN channel. The first assumption we make is that we transmit only one code word and it's sufficient to look at one code word for the analysis. And this one code word is the all zero code word. We know the LDPC code is a linear code, so the all zero code word is part of the um, code. So we need, we consider the all zero code word. So it's uh, this corresponds if we have a binary input AW gen channel, means we transmit plus one. Let's recall that x double dot is equal to minus one to the power x. And if x is equal to zero, this is equal to plus one. So why is this sufficient? Well, proving this is a little bit more involved and a little bit technical, but you can show that the performance of the decoder does not depend on the specific code word, but it only depends on the noise. So what we have is we have a decoder and it makes an error, not depending on what code word it has, but only depending on the noise value it gets. This is clear because we also saw that in a linear code, the weight distribution tells us what is the distance of different code words how many code words are there at a certain weight from the code that we are looking at and doesn't depend on what code word we are sitting on. Same for this decoder. The decoder only depends on the noise pattern. You can actually factor out the noise out of the decoder. So what you can do is you can say that we have a situation y double dot is equal to x double dot plus the noise. And we can say, we can write this equivalently, is it equal to x double dot times some noise z, which has a different distribution, but that's a different way of expressing the noise. And then the uh, performance of the decoder only depends on this extra noise z. You can factor out x double dot from the decoder and only afterwards add it to the code. So we can only look at one code word and we transmit the all zero code word and that's sufficient for the analysis. So now we look at what happens at the decoder and how, what are the distributions of the messages. So what is the input to the decoder? The input to the decoder is a channel transition log likelihood ratio. And we know it gets computed by taking the channel output y and multiplying it by lc. So what is y? y is simple. So y is a message we have transmitted plus one, and then we add noise to it. So y kind of looks like this. The variance of this noise is sigma n squared, and the mean is equal to plus one. Gaussian distributed, mean plus one, variance sigma n squared. Now we multiply this with a constant LC. So if we multiply this random variable with a constant LC, 
we get another random variable that has a, what is this? F y of y. So we get another random variable that has a constant, has a mean plus one times LC. What is LC? LC is, really call, LC is equal to four times ES over n zero, equal to two divided by sigma n squared. So mu L is two divided by sigma n squared. And the variance of this is the variance of the original random variable multiplied by the square of the constant that we multiply. So sigma L squared is LC squared times sigma n squared. So this is four divided by sigma n power four times sigma n power squared. So this is four over sigma n squared. And we can relate these two guys. So mu L is equal to one half times sigma L squared or sigma L squared is equal to two times the mean. So this is what we call a symmetric Gaussian because it just depends on one parameter on the mean mu L. It has a mean that is equal to two over sigma n squared and the variance that is equal to four over sigma n squared. So it just depends on one parameter. This is very nice. So we have the following result. So if we transmit the plus one code word over the binary input AWGN channel, the channel transition log likelihood ratios are Gaussian distributed with sigma L squared being equal to four over sigma N squared, or eight times the S of N zero, and mu L being equal to mu C, or sigma L squared divided by two, which we define as mu C. Mu C is equal to four times E S over N zero is equal to two divided by sigma N squared. So mean and variance are connected. They are just defined by one parameter. You cannot freely choose the mean and the variance. Anymore. So the take home message here is the distribution can be defined by a single parameter, which is the mean mu L. And we immediately obtain the variance from the mean by just taking twice the mean. So let's take a look at an example. So we show the distributions for a variety of signal to noise ratios ranging from minus three dB to plus five dB. And this is what we have. So here we see the distribution of the log likelihood ratios for ES of zero of minus three dB. Then we get this Gaussian. And we see that if we increase the channel, um, channel parameter, so if our channel becomes better, we have a higher signal to noise ratio, the other one zero becomes five dB, then this is what we get. So you can see the distribution gets broader because sigma n squared, sigma L squared increases, but the mean increases at the same time. It's kind of counterintuitive because it gets broader it means it should get worse, but because the mean increases similarly, it actually gets better. And you can see this by looking at this, the error probability. The error probability is when we make a decision, a wrong decision, so the log likelihood ratio gets negative. And we see that here we have quite a big area if ES of 0 is minus 3 dB. And if ES of 0 is plus 5 dB, we have quite small area and the error probability is rather small. So this is the distribution of the messages that enter the decoder. So this is what's going in, into the decoder. So let's take a close a further look at what's going on. So the nice thing about uh, what we have here, that's because we have an output symmetric channel, is that this distribution f of l given x double dot equals plus one. So the distribution of the log likelihood ratios when you transmit plus one 
is also sufficient to describe the distribution of the log likelihood ratios when we transmit a mite one. So this guy. So this we can calculate. So it's a little bit um, it's a small effort. So we can calculate f of L given x double not equals minus one. Essentially, it's the distribution of the log likelihood ratios. We can submit a minus one, so it gets shifted to minus LC. So the mean now becomes minus LC. The variance is the same, sigma L squared. So now we do a small trick because we want to relate this to the um, distribution of the log likelihood ratios if we transmit a plus one. We can do this by having one thing here minus LC. So we put a minus LC inside, but we need to correct this error by um, changing this middle term. So here we have y squared plus 2 times y times LC plus LC squared. Here we have minus 2 times y LC, but we need to get plus 2 times. So now to get that, we need to add 4 times y times LC. So this is just to have equality between these two expressions. And now we use the fact that we have an exponential. So exponential of sum is the product of the individual exponentials. So we have exponential of this guy that we know already times the exponential of this guy. Okay, so this expression here, this is what we know already. This guy is the probability density of f of L given x double dot is equal to plus one. And now we simplify the second guy. So we insert again LC is equal to 2 over sigma L squared. And sigma L squared is equal to 4 over sigma N squared. So we insert these. So we insert LC over here. We insert sigma L squared over here. And we can cancel quite a lot. So we cancel 4. We cancel a 2. And we cancel... 1 over sigma n squared. So what we are left with is e to the power minus y times f of l given x double dot equals plus 1. So just by multiplying with e to the power minus y, we can transform between the two PDFs. And this actually doesn't hold only for the AWGen channel, but we can show that this holds for every output symmetric channel this is the case okay so we have this now we take a look at what happens inside the decoder and we start simple we start with the regular code and what we do is a technique that is called density evolution so it means that we look at the densities of um, the messages that we pass inside the decoder. So we know we have just calculated f of l given x double dot equals plus one. So what is coming in? We know that this is Gaussian distributed. And now inside the variable node, recall the decoder. In the variable node, so the message going from vi to pj, in calculate the variable node is L tilde i plus the sum over all j prime element in the neighborhood of uh, v i minus j of L c going from c j prime to v i. So we have incoming messages. They are distributed along to f of l chi. So this is the distribution of the messages. And we sum up the random variable. So we take a sum of random variable. Now we go back into our probability theory course. So what happens if we sum, what happens to the PDF of the sum of two random variables? We sum two random variables, the PDF of the summation is the convolution of the individual PDFs. So because we have a 
summation of inputs and channel transition log likelihood ratios, the PDF of the output message is obtained by convolution of the input PDFs. We use this operator to denote convolution. So it's f of l given x double dot, convolved with f of l chi, convolved with f of l chi. This, we need to carry out this convolution, dv minus 1 times. So we can essentially calculate the distribution of the outgoing message if we know the distribution of the messages coming from the check. So now we calculate the distribution of the check notes. Well, that's a little bit more complicated um, because we have a transform. So we have a few random variables and the output of this random variable is obtained by applying this hyperbolic tangent equation, this guy. So we have a transformation of random variables and you would need to calculate this transformation using the Jacobian, for instance, and uh, carry out this uh, calculation to get the distribution. And uh, essentially, this is the, the integral over the um, f of l xis, um, such that this condition is fulfilled. And um, this is not something easy. Essentially, we have to resort to numerical methods to evaluate the integral. So um, this is not something we will do. It's something you can do numerically. And we have a MATLAB script that illustrates you how to do this using a Monte Carlo method, essentially. And um, um, we'll just look at the results. So let's look at an example. So we look at the 3.6 LPC code and we numerically evaluate the PDFs starting from the initial Gaussian distribution. And we fix an EB of N0 of 2.1 dB, and this roughly corresponds to a EL0 of N0 of minus 1 dB. So we do 10 iterations of decoding, and we show always the output PDF of the messages computed by the check nodes, L of chi, and the output PDF of the messages computed by the variable nodes L of C. So this is what we have at the um, output of the channel. So this is what we get. We have a, a mean of around four. And this is the, the channel message, L of L given, um, given X. So now we'll do the decoding. So iteration one, the variable node to check node messages are the ones uh, they correspond essentially to what we get from the channel. And then the check node calculates um, its output. And this is the probability density function. The messages calculated after the check nodes have calculated their messages first. This is numerically evaluated, so you see it's a little bit imprecise here. These are numerical instabilities, but you get an Kind of a good idea of what is going on here. So now we do look after the second iteration. So this is the messages again at the output of the variable nodes. And this is the messages at the output of the check nodes. So it's this very big peak around zero, and then it is slightly dampening, falling off towards higher values. Now after Three iterations, the situation looks like this. So variable node to check nodes again looks rather Gaussian. And it makes sense because we have the central limit theorem saying if we add a lot of um, a lot of random variables that are IID, the result approaches something that looks Gaussian. Although we are very far away from an infinite number of additions, the messages that come in, they are Fairly, one of them is already Gaussian, the channel output, and the other ones are fairly close to Gaussian, so we expect something that is close to some Gaussian. And now the check to variable node message also approaches something that looks like Gaussian, except that there is this peak in the middle, but that's um, 
it approaches something close to Gaussian. So let's go to the next iteration. Verbal node to check node message looks like this again. Check the verbal node like this. So this peak at zero is decreasing while the message distribution is broadening. And after five iterations, after six iterations, after seven iterations, so you can see everything moves already to the right. And um, we are now after eight iteration. Now something happens. I need to move a little bit because of numerical issues. Um, we can only represent a finite support of the distributions. So this distribution is essentially something that is infinitely uh, broad because we have a Gaussian at the channel of. So what we do is we truncate at 13. And then we assume that we put a direct pulse at plus infinity. So everything that's not between minus 10 and 30 gets assigned to a direct pulse at plus infinity. So this is direct pulse at plus infinity. So now let's take a look after nine iterations. So now after nine iterations, now we start truncating a little bit more here, as you can see, and the direct pulse at plus infinity gets higher. And after 10 iterations, it's also already very high. And essentially everything is at plus infinity or log likelihood ratio larger than 30. So now if we plot all the messages together, we get this, this diagram here. So in the verbal note to check note messages that you can see here, you see that the messages, they are all rather Gaussian distributed. The mean changes, they get also broader, just as we have seen for the channel. But also for the check to verbal node messages, we can see that after a few iterations, they approach a Gaussian and then stay more or less Gaussian. So this is something that we can now use for the analysis by just assuming that the messages are Gaussian. So we make an approximation and we approximate the messages to be Gaussian. So if you like to look at this, and if you like to reproduce these results, you can take a look at this MATLAB script, PDF evaluation Monte Carlo, and that carries out the Monte Carlo evaluation of the PDFs for the binary input AWG channel. And um, this is being done using particle method or Monte Carlo method. So instead of representing the densities as real densities, this is also something you can do and then run into convolutions. We just assume that we have a set of um, samples from our random distribution, and then we manipulate those samples. So we generate new samples by adding up values, by carrying out the operations of the decoder, and then get a set of new samples. And then we just take histograms to evaluate the probability density functions. So what we observe, and this is the most important part, the variable to check note messages are approximately Gaussian distributed with a mean mu C and the variance two times mu C. Now, the situation is different for the check to variable note messages. The, the shape is more exponential in the first iterations, but then it distributes, oh, then it approaches also a Gaussian shape. And in fact, it also turns out that um, sigma chi squared is equal to two times mu chi, the more final iterations. And this is the basis for the assumption that we take. So the assumption that we make is the following. We approximate the messages by Gaussian distributed messages with the parameter mu and the variance of two times mu. And this is what we call a Gaussian approximation. So initially, the mean of the messages that come from the channel is mu c. Initially, we have mu c. Then we come from the channel. And then we send this to the check nodes. Send this to the check nodes. We get um, um, also the first mu c is equal to mu c. And then uh, we continue with these messages. 
So now with this approximation, maybe we can calculate what's going on in the variable nodes and check nodes and just see how do the actions of the variable nodes and the actions of the check node change the mean of the Gaussian messages. So we just look at the Gaussian messages with one parameter. We have one single parameter that is mu. The variance is not a parameter, the variance is related to mu because it's twice the mean. Always. This is our assumption that we make. Okay, so let's take a look at what's going on. So we start with the variable nodes. At the variable nodes, the PDFs of the messages are obtained by convolution of the input messages. So now we know that all the messages are Gaussian distributed. So what happens with the convolution of Gaussian PDFs? And fortunately, there is a theorem, and we can say that if we convolve a Gaussian PDF with mean mu1 and variance sigma1, with the second Gaussian PDF mean mu2 and variance sigma2, we get another Gaussian PDF that has a mean of mu1 plus mu2 and a variance of sigma1 squared plus sigma2 squared. So the means add up and the variances add up. Of course, I should say um, we assume that the random variables that are underlined, they are independent because otherwise we cannot just use the convolution. So we assume that there's independency, then we can convolve the PDFs. But we assume independency of the messages anyhow. So now we can specialize this if we have a PDF that has mean mu1 and variance 2 times mu1, we have another one mean mu2 and variance 2 times mu2, then the resulting mean is mu1 plus mu2, the resulting variance is 2 times mu1 plus mu2. So now we can state the following. We have an update equation again that we are looking at. And the mean of the input messages, the variable on that iteration L, is equal to mu chi L. So now we can calculate the output of the variable nodes. This is mu CL. That's the mean of the channel, mu C. Plus, we have dv minus 1 incoming messages, not to calculate an outgoing message, so plus dv minus 1 times mu chi l. So that's our update equation for the variable nodes. So the variable nodes essentially increase the mean of the channel transition LLRs by dv minus 1 times mu chi l. And initially, mu chi 0 is equal to 0. That's the initial point because the first iteration, we just have the channel output, nothing else. Okay, so variable nodes is easy. Now we take a look at the check nodes. Then it's a slightly more involved, but it's okay. It's something we can do. So we look at the update equation. That's our check node update equation. And we are interested in the mean of the messages. We assume they are Gaussian distributed. We are interested in the mean. So what do we do? We take the expectation on both sides because the expectation gives us the mean. So we take the expectation on both sides and we have this expression. And then we assume that the messages are independent. We have independence of the messages. So we can take the product out of the expectation. This is because of independence of the messages, we can move the product outside of the expectation. So now we just remain us to calculate this expectation. So some abuse of notation, the expectation of the hyperbolic tangent of the L value by with distribution of chi divided by two is, the, is equal to the expectation of L xi divided by two to the power dc minus 1. Why can we do this? Because these messages all have the same distribution. So this is essentially a random variable that has a distribution of 
L of C. So we have the expectations and are all the same, so we can take them to the power DC minus one. Okay. So what is this guy now, this expectation? We just calculate the expectation. So the expectation of the hyperbolic tangent of L chi divided by two is just the integral of the Gaussian PDF. We have a mean mu chi and the variance is two times mu chi. So instead of two times sigma chi squared, we insert mu, so it's four mu chi. Here we also have four times mu chi. We multiply with hyperbolic tangent of how divided by two. Can we solve this integral? No, unfortunately not. So there is no known way of how to solve this integral. And um, we have to resort again to a numerical method to resolve this integral. So we can um, define this integral and in order, instead of defining the integral directly, we define a function phi of mu, which is one minus the integral. And we just do this because then it resembles a little bit more the case of the binary erasure channel. That's why we use one minus here. And we define as if mu is larger than zero. If mu is equal to zero, this guy is equal to one. And mu cannot be smaller than zero. Because the mean, we start with a mean of plus mu c. And we will always increase the mean. So the mean can never get zero. So this is this phi function. Okay. So what, how does this function look like? A rather unspectacular function. So this is the phi function. So it starts off at one and then it decreases to increase the mean to go towards zero. So not something that is very spectacular. We can approximate this function. This is something we'll find using a, just an exponential approximation. So um, for the case mu smaller than 10, this looks like an exponential and we approximate it using the exponential function e to the power alpha times mu to the power gamma plus beta. And these are the values of alpha, beta and gamma that you obtain from curve fitting. And if mu is larger or equal than 10, the exponential doesn't uh, need to correct the exponential a little bit, then you get this approximation. So now we can write the check note update as follows. So it's one minus phi of mu chi L is one minus phi of mu C L minus one to the power DC minus one. And now we can combine everything. So we can insert mu C mu C is equal to mu C plus dv minus one times mu chi minus one. And now we can get an update equation in terms of mu chi. So for the binary rigid channel, we looked at C. Now we look at chi because it's a little bit simpler, but that's um, how we get our update equation. So we have a mu chi L is equal to phi to the power minus one of one minus one minus phi of mu c plus dv minus one times mu chi at iteration l minus one to the power dc minus one. And with this, we can check if for certain parameters, this mu chi will converge to plus infinity. And if it does so, we know that our code will be able to decode because the message is extremely reliable and get infinitely reliable, in fact. So let's take a look at an example. And here we look at the 3.6 LPC code on the binary input AWGN channel. So we have the situation for ES of n0 minus 1 dB. And we see that the mean quickly grows to infinity. And we plot it as a function of the iteration. We start iterating somewhere around here and we quickly go to infinity. If uh, ES of one zero is minus 1.6, takes a few more iterations, but then we jump to infinity. ES of one zero is minus 
jump to infinity, minus 1.84. Eventually, after 120 updates, we jump to infinity. So the messages, they go to infinity. And if our EB, ES over 0 is minus 2 dB, then we converge, we get stuck. So we don't, are not able to decode, but we have messages that get stuck. We're in a fixed part. So the distribution of our messages does not change anymore, and we have a mean that is around 1. And of course, because we have a Gaussian, it means that our messages will have an error and will not be able to recover this error anymore. So this is what is going on here. So we cannot decode for minus 2 dB, also not for minus 3 dB, because our error will be even worse. So how can we extend this towards irregular codes? Well, in the very same way um, as before, we can just look at mixtures of distributions. So instead of having a distribution that just follows one mean, we have a mixture of distributions. And we get the following update equation. So this is the update equation. And again, we have the uh, averaging of a rho j here because the messages, some of the messages come from a variable node of degree two, some of the messages come from a variable node of degree four, and so on. And some of the messages come from a check node of a certain degree. And then we just take the average because we have a mix of the different messages. So we need to average the different distributions. The same thing at the variable node. Here again, we need to average with lambda i's. So let's take a look at a, a specific code. And we have a code of rate one half. Here we have the degree distribution. And uh, recall for um, rate one half, the S of n zero minimum is minus 2.83 dB on the binary input AWGN channel. So this is the capacity. This is equal to C. We cannot decode at a smaller ES of n zero. This is the limit. This is the capacity of the channel for rate one half code. We cannot go beyond that. So let's take a look at how this irregular code performs, this guy. And this is what we have. So for minus 3 dB, we are beyond capacity. Well, the channel is worse than capacity. We cannot decode. For minus 2.6 dB, we can not decode. But for minus 2.52 dB, we do 450 updates and we are able to decode. Actually, this is a code that is at least asymptotically able to decode. It has a threshold that is 0 0.3 dB away from capacity. So it's an outstanding good code. So the capacity we call C is minus 2.83 dB. And here we can decode at minus 2.52 dB, 0 0.3 dB away from capacity. And if we increase ES of 0 by minus 0 0.1 dB, already after 120 steps, we are going towards capacity. So we can decode even so again, this is an extremely good code and has an extremely good performance. Okay, with this, we are at the end of the introduction. The next thing we're going to look at is exit charts.